the decisions about who gets money and on what terms uh, will shape and distort the economy for years to come. Uh, the government is really involved in life and death uh, decisions uh, for the enterprises. Uh, I think the kind of uh, thing that Marcus talked about, an evergreening proposal to get the government out of those life and death decisions is a, a, an interesting way of trying to uh, 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 have the government step back from the kinds of, of uh, 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 decisions that it's been making. And I'll say a little bit more about that later, but in our interesting article that just came out today uh, by Peter Orzak, who used to be the head of OMB, points out that the money is disproportionately going to large enterprises, and we are in the process of reshaping our economy with more inequality, uh, advantaging the large enterprises relative to the small. Uh, and the final point is that the crises and their aftermath tend to be moments of intense distributive conflict. Uh, and um, we should expect nothing less and how these distributive conflicts are resolved will have profound effects uh, on our society. Uh, and we are already seeing that um, in the battles uh, for uh, how the money gets spent. Uh, the banks, the large businesses are among the winners and obviously the low income individuals, the states, higher educational institutions are the ones that so far uh, are among the losers. Let me go, uh, next slide. So in talking about uh, the responses, it, it, it seems to me makes sense to begin by uh, thinking about where we were uh, before the crisis. Uh, we had uh, high levels of inequality. Uh, we had a weak system of social protection. Um, these were uh, weaknesses we reflected in uh, low levels of life expectancy, high incidence of health problems, um, the kinds of things that uh, Case and Deaton have done uh, such a good job in exposing in their wonderful book, uh, Deaths of Despair, uh, low levels of health insurance coverage, few hospital beds relative to the population. Um, and the real concern, of course, is that uh, the way we manage this crisis is going to exacerbate uh, these inequalities. Uh, COVID-19 is not an equal opportunity killer. It's going after those with weak health, uh, those uh, who are not in a position to protect themselves. And I'll talk about that uh, a little bit uh, later. And that uh, uh, means that uh, the incidence of the disease uh, has been particularly hard on those at the bottom and people uh, of color, uh, African-American and Hispanics. The next few slides just go through very, very quickly, uh, just highlighting some of the weaknesses in the US. Uh, the death rates uh, in the United States uh, are much higher than in other countries. Uh, the blue is the US. Uh, and uh, the next slide. Uh, uh, shows another picture of uh, deaths um, uh, in the United States uh, for um, uh, under uh, age 70 and, and for the population as a whole. Again, the U.S. is so much higher uh, than in uh, other countries. Uh, next slide. This shows, uh, again, uh, a stark difference with between US and other advanced countries, much lower life expectancy, and it shows uh, the decline in life expectancy. Uh, next slide. Uh, the, this shows uh, uh, health insurance coverage, obviously lower than others, where uh, everybody, the, the right to access to healthcare is, is viewed as a basic human right. Next slide. And, uh, this shows that uh, uh, after uh, Obamacare was passed, we succeeded in bringing down the number of uninsured dramatically, but that um, since uh, Trump has gotten elected, uh, the number of uninsured uh, has gone up. 
This is all background for thinking about the government programs to address the uh, the crisis. And um, there are three part. Next slide. There are three. Uh, we can. Uh, oh, oh. That, I'm sorry. I left that out. Um, U.S. has also markedly fewer hospital beds per thousand people than the average of the advanced countries. So, um, in a way, this is part of. Uh, we prided ourselves on efficiency. We used, uh, uh, we made sure that every hospital bed was fully used, but that meant we were uh, less resilient. It's like uh, cars without spare tires. Uh, we had a healthcare system without spare tires. And of course that uh, makes it much more difficult to respond. Next slide. So, uh, these are all background for thinking about uh, the uh, government programs to uh, deal with the economy. Uh, and there are three aspects of this. The first is obviously not only dealing with the economy, but with uh, the health issue. Uh, there is going to be an interaction uh, between the ways in which we uh, our, uh, 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 what our programs do and the extent of the disease uh, contagion uh, are not. Um, the second is to protect the vulnerable. And the third is to ensure conditions of a robust recovery. And what I'm gonna to try to explain is that actually in spite of the magnitude of the expenditures, it looks like the programs have failed and on all three accounts. Uh, next slide. So I'm gonna go through and talk about each of these uh, in turn. Uh, I won't go through all uh, the aspects of these because each of these has uh, a number of different uh, 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 ingredients. Uh, in some ways, the fights over the programs to maintain health are the ones I find uh, least able to understand uh, because obviously, when you have a public health issue, when the disease spreads, it it threatens uh, the well-being of everybody, it's uh, to inferior. And yet we've had a lot of fights over uh, these programs. Uh, the first issue is one that uh, Marcus uh, highlighted in, in his poll. Uh, we don't want people who are sick going to work. And uh, the U.S. has the... Uh, poorest provision of uh, paid sick leave of any of the advanced countries, uh, only 30% in the lowest decile of the population. And a lot of these are the people on the front line, the delivery workers who get exposed. Only 30% uh, have, have paid sick leave. Congress, in a sense, recognized the importance. Uh, it passed a, a mandatory paid sick leave but then it gutted the bill by exempting about 80%. All those uh, with employers uh, uh, with more than 500, uh, as well as small employers. Um, and that really speaks uh, very much to, to the question that Marcus asked. Um, the uh, big companies uh, did not want to provide uh, sick leave even limited to COVID-19 uh, illnesses, which to me is, is really quite uh, remarkable, really clear that they did not in any way internalize the externality that they were imposing. There are other issues dealing with uh, undocumented workers, um, uh, uh, making sure that people have access uh, to healthcare. One thing that I think is particularly disturbing is, uh, regulations that would make sure that frontline workers uh, had protective gear like masks. Uh, and OSHA under Trump has refused to impose uh, these as basic safety standards. And it's interesting here in New York, uh, some of the unions have been strong enough to demand the protections, but in other areas where the unions are not so strong, that has not happened. Uh, next slide. Uh, there are a couple uh, basic aspects of uh, underlying economics, which sh should be obvious. Um, contagious disease are about externalities. Uh, 
very interesting aspects of the mathematics of contagious disease don't have time to talk about, but uh, the nature of an externality is that individuals, employers, incentives are not aligned with those of society. That's why you need government intervention. Um, people, the, uh, when people interact with other people, uh, they don't take into account the, the social cost uh, that uh, they exert. Uh, in some societies, uh, people may do that better, just like in some societies, people litter less than in others. But it's very clear uh, that has not been the case uh, in the United States. But the second aspect is that workers don't have bargaining power. And we saw that in the point I made before about uh, these employers with uh, over uh, uh, 500 employees, um, they should be given protective gear. They should have paid sick leave when they uh, have COVID-19. And uh, in fact, the employers treat them as if they were disposable commodities. The third thing I, I think that has not gotten as much attention and would be a talk on its own, I hope you come back and, and talk about it, is uh, the intellectual property regime, which has long been recognized not to promote access to medicines, vaccines, other products. Um, and right now it appears to be uh, part of the problem. Uh, the N95 masks are covered by numerous patents and the administration seems to unwilling to use compulsory licenses uh, to make uh, these more widely uh, available. Um, Jody has several questions on, on this issue. So do you, would you agree? So Vinit Sharma wants to know whether intellectual property rights by the big pharma industry is a major inefficiency during the crisis. And then Sayantan wants to know whether you agree with Angus Deaton that the low insurance rate in the US is because of the healthcare lobby uh, and some other socioeconomic linkages and explains that. Well, I mean, clearly um, the failure of our uh, country to have uh, a, a system of universal uh, uh, health care is a result of the lobbying of the uh, health care uh, insurance industry. Um, you, we saw that in real time, and I saw when I was in the Clinton administration, uh, that kind of lobbying. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the programs that we uh, have may not be ideal, but uh, they were intended to uh, uh, move us towards uh, universal access to healthcare uh, in one way or another. Uh, and it's, the lobbying has been enormous uh, stopping that. Uh, the most uh, telling provision was uh, under Obamacare, there was a public option that would make sure that no matter where you were in the country, you could have access to Medicare if you opted for, for it. It wasn't forcing it, but the, the, the private health insurance companies did not want competition from uh, the government as an option, not a compulsion, but an option. And that is what is really explains what uh, the most important reason we don't have uh, health care. Um, IPR uh, is, I think, uh, going to be even more of an impediment uh, if we don't use compulsory licenses. And it's going to be a real problem in developing countries uh, uh, in access to vaccines and uh, antivirals. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, we have provisions within the TRIPS uh, agreement for compulsory licenses, but governments have to be willing to use those. Next slide. Uh, the second uh, objective of the programs is uh, protecting the vulnerable and maintaining workers link within the uh, uh, work, workplace. Um, again, the US preconditions were worse. We had a poor system of unemployment insurance. Uh, 
both in coverage and replacement. Um, but the broad consensus that the most cost-effective way of providing assistance uh, and setting a precondition for recovery is to ma maintain the link uh, with the employer. It avoids the cost of rehiring, the retraining. Uh, earlier research has shown that displacements, uh, uh, furloughs are associated with larger cerebral effects, lowering wages and, and by implication productivity over the wrong, long run. And this is especially important in the US where uh, a majority depends on employer provided health insurance care and uh, switching from that into a Medicaid would be a, a major disruption. Um, but as we all know, the US performance has been, well, even though several of the programs were designed, were intended to maintain the workers link with the workplace, it's obviously failed with 24 million newly unemployed um, and uh, the highest increase within the advanced countries. The next slide. Um, the, the next two slides show the, uh, the U.S. has a very low level of protection uh, on unemployment insurance, the worst of the advanced countries. And uh, what uh, U.S. has after six months uh, is particularly low. And the next shows the replacement rate, next slide, um, is also uh, particularly low for the United States. The next slide. Uh, the next slide shows the increase in unemployment in the United States compared to uh, other uh, uh, advanced countries, um, uh, markedly higher. And in that list are countries like Italy that have had uh, obviously been very badly afflicted by uh, the corona uh, COVID-19. Isn't this a little bit distorted because you have the short term work where in many countries firms are paid to keep their workers on the payroll while in the US they're laid off and then they get unemployment benefits. Oh, we, in the case for Germany, that's clearly the case, but but uh, uh, this is true. You know, you, you look at different countries with different programs and I'm going to come explain why this is, you know, it, it is. I think it has a lot to do with the, the design of the programs uh, that we put in place. And I'll, I'll try to explicitly address why they there, haven't worked. There's another there are a number of other the factors that go into this. One? The, one, one person in the audience would like to know whether the federal structure in the United States was really making things worse. So the fact that everything is organized at the state by state level, or many things are organized at the federal, not at the federal, but the state by state level, was this a hindrance? to get a, a quick response? Um, I think it, uh, the, 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 um, the critical thing I'm gonna put a, my, my finger on is the federal programs. Uh, it is clear that the reliance on state programs has been a, pro a problem. Uh, some states like Florida have not updated their their software for years. Uh, that was a whole. Uh, uh, they were trying to make people were not getting unemployment insurance. So that's clearly contributed uh, to the problem. But and, and that's part of the preconditions that I described before that we didn't really have a good unemployment insurance system, and that's partly because it was relying on the state. But the rescue packages are also uh, deficient. And that's what I want to focus my remarks uh, uh, to right now on, okay? okay. So uh, explaining the failures, the uh, problem is that uh, the programs were not comprehensive. They were not well-targeted. They were shaped more by who had the best lobbyists than an analysis of where the money would be uh, most effective in dealing with unemployment uh, with the people who were uh, uh, most vulnerable. Uh, and uh, you see that uh, as an example in uh, what's going to be a big problem, uh, 
failure to give money to state and local governments, which you've become a, at the center of controversy, and I'll come talk about that explicitly. Uh, the most controversial program is called the PPP program, which was intended for small business, and it was particularly poorly designed. And I, I, I'm, I'll talk about it because it, in a way, illustrates uh, all the failures uh, of, of, of the program in a, in a uh, 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 sort of a encapsulated way. It had high administrative cost. Um, the banks uh, were at the intermediary. Uh, they're getting about 1%. That means they're getting uh, to administer a program uh, of about uh, $7 billion, uh, uh, 700 billion. They're gonna get uh, $7 billion just for transferring uh, administrative uh, electronic information. They're not vetting. They're not really responsible. Um, for risk uh, is just a electronic intermediary. But the real problem with having banks as intermediaries, the money went to those who were good customers of the banks, construction firms, large firms, uh, not the most vulnerable. McKinsey did a study of what were the most vulnerable industry sectors, and you look at those and you look at where the money went, and the two are not aligned at all. Um, 4% of the loans, which are the big loans, accounted for almost half of all the money. On the other hand, the loans that went to small people uh, accounted only uh, for 17% uh, of the funds. And uh, uh, a, a number of uh, uh, got uh, loans of more than $5 million, totally out of keeping with the intent. Next slide. Uh, there, there were some further problems. Uh, one that was not really uh, anticipated was the lack of trust. There are provisions in the program of loan forgiveness if the employer retains his workers. And that key provision that was thought would keep the link between workers uh, and their firm. The problem is that uh, Many firms, uh, we've heard, uh, did not trust the government uh, promises of loan forgiveness. Uh, there was a worry that in the end, they would find some picayune reason uh, to say, oh, you violated this provision or that provision. And so that the small businesses would not, in fact, uh, get that loan uh, forgiven. And uh, many used the money just to build up capital buffers. Uh, there's been a lot of lack of transparency, and probably the most interesting, uh, most important, is this lack of prioritization. Uh, the first tranche went off uh, in in a few days, and we're expe they're expecting the second tranche to go out in a couple of days uh, to be exhausted. Um, and uh, with money so scarce, they, uh, there was a real need to identify where money would be most effective. Uh, and that actually uh, is related to an interesting set of uh, research that I've been involved with with uh, some colleagues of mine on asking, uh, it's analogous to the question, uh, if the government is going to have limited funds to bail out banks, and banks are connected in networks, uh, how do you identify the banks that are most central, whose death would be most uh, damaging to the economic system or whose net cost to the government, to our society would be highest. And there's a series of papers that we've done where we've identified that. And we're now working on a, a, a similar kind of question. Can we identify what sectors of the economy would be uh, most critical for uh, um, getting money uh, especially if you put weight on uh, individuals who are most vulnerable. Next slide. Um, so can, can I ask some questions sure. uh, from Marcus Miller? Would like to know whether you see something to Super Chapter 11. You I'm coming that to earlier. that. Great question, okay. Marcus. And uh, <laughs> Marcus and I have a paper uh, that we wrote on that subject. So I'm, I'm going and to. A particular application to the pharma industry. For yeah. the healthcare, healthcare industry. Yeah, very much so. So 
there were alternatives and many of the European countries uh, chose those alternatives, uh, which entailed giving money directly to employers who maintain employment. We have, you know, the IRS and the Social Security Administration has electronic interfaces with every company and they know the data on the employment. Uh, and uh, there are uh, uh, a proposal from uh, Representative Jayapal and uh, a proposal from a group of senators. Um, the, there have been cost estimates of this alternative, and it's a, a fraction of the cost of the PPP program, roughly between 115 to 150 uh, billion dollars, depending on the parameter uh, that you chose. And the programs are comprehensive. Uh, they don't entail banks or SBA picking winners, uh, which sectors uh, to go to. Next slide. So the point is that uh, though we spent uh, $2.7 trillion, trillion um, it won't be enough because it was so badly designed and targeted. And as I said before, the whole mindset was it would be a short program. And now it's very clear it's gonna be a, a long-term uh, program. Um, and uh, that uh, raises the question, uh, the debt GDP ratio is already estimated to be 101% by September, according to data just coming out from the CBO, and the deficit of around $3.7 trillion the, uh, is going to be around 18% of GDP. And in some of the previous sessions, there have been some concerns about whether this will lead to uh, inflationary pressures. I wanna come back to that at the end uh, my remarks. Um, and in spite of all this money, there are some important uh, uh, emissions. The first I want to mention on this slide, I feel a little bit self-serving, but I think it's actually true and important. Uh, the education and research institutions, revenues are down. The amount of money that would be need, needed to keep them whole is really very, very small. Uh, there was an article in the FT uh, uh, giving the with uh, an estimate of a, like twenty six uh, billion dollars shortfall, but the social cost of not providing that support could be uh, enormous. Next slide. But the other uh, major emission is uh, state and local government, and uh, here uh, the point is very clear. Uh, we saw the 2008 crisis, tax revenues declines were almost twice that of GDP. Um, the states have balanced budget frameworks. That means when their revenues go down, they have to reduce uh, their expenditures. They're uh, uh, very labor intensive. Uh, and so the implication of all this is that there, we have built in austerity um, at the state and local level. We've seen that play out in other economic downturns in the Great Depression, uh, in the Great Recession. And um, important thing is the federal lending facility doesn't solve the problem because it's a constraint they have. Uh, if you look at the timing, it's likely to show up just when we're, uh, because of the lags, when we're trying to get out. And this, these expenditures are really key to education, welfare, and social protection. Uh, next slide. So that comes to the, the uh, third uh, major uh, aspect of uh, uh, the programs, establishing the conditions for strong and quick recovery, and a lot of attention on focus, providing uh, liquidity. Uh, and uh, massive amounts going to corporations. The back, big lacuna is households. They did some things, government insured programs, student loans, uh, for uh, government student loans, but many others were left out. Uh, uh, credit card debt, car loans. Um, in a sense, the rest of the country was put on hold and uh, banks, uh, continue to collect interest. It's especially problematic with usurious interest rates and fees. Uh, 
uh, and the balance sheet effects, I'll come through that in one second, uh, can be disastrous. And already the symptoms are showing up. Um, the failure to pay, pay the rents uh, at the uh, end uh, of last month was already almost double what it was in previous years. So uh, I want to final in my talk with uh, paying attention to three uh, critical tasks for recovery. Next slide. Um, the first of these is the standard macro models. They could act with a vengeance, I'll explain why. The second is avoiding debt spirals and bankruptcy cascades, uh, the kind of thing that, that Marcus uh, talked a little bit about. And finally, managing supply chain problems. So let me begin with those. The macro models, multipliers, next slide, uh, are straightforward. Uh, but what I want to emphasize is just two points. One is the balance sheets of firms, uh, households uh, will be hurt uh, very badly. And the second thing is there's going to be an increase in uncertainty. We're clearly off an equilibrium path, little uncertainty about the future course of the economy, and that will induce precautionary behavior. So the two together, the adverse effects on balance sheets, the increase in precautionary behavior are inevitably going to have a very big effect on aggregate demand. And so while this crisis began as a, uh, not a deficiency in aggregate demand like 2008, uh, uh, it was a COVID-19 crisis, uh, interruption in supply and demand, it will morph into a standard aggregate demand deficiency um, unless we undertake the right measures. And we have to remember that the multipliers in deep downturns are very large. Uh, one of the things that came out of the uh, uh, research, empirical research that was done in the aftermath of the 2008 crisis. Next slide. The second big issue are the deck spirals that I saw very vividly in the 1997 East Asia crisis. Um, and these uh, can result in financial gridlock, bankruptcy cascade. The idea is A can't, uh, if A doesn't pay B, B can't pay C, C can't pay uh, uh, A again. Uh, you have a uh, network of uh, financial liabilities and uh, they can give rise to systemic uh, bankruptcy. And in the case of the East Asia crisis, it was 70% of the Indonesian firms, 50% of the Korean firms, and almost 50% of the Thai firms. And when you have the systemic uh, gridlock, bankruptcy, bank, uh, gridlock, uh, it's very hard uh, to resolve. Uh, it's uh, a complex uh, uh, interdependent system, the mathematical problem uh, of resolving it. Uh, has actually only recently been uh, uh, solved. And uh, it's particularly important, complex when there are bankruptcy costs, of course, and those can be very large and been well, uh, well identified. And this is where I talk about what Marcus raised, the uh, Super Chapter 11. Um, Marcus and I, back in the East Asia crisis, said that you know chapter 11 provides a framework for dealing with it on a case by case basis but when you have so many uh so many uh bankruptcies you need a different set of presumptions and you need to do this things uh very very rapidly okay, can you explain it how, how would it work oh it's just a different it's very much like cha chapter 11 but chapter 11, unfortunately, doesn't work very quickly. So chapter 11 allows uh, each of the parties to submit their proposals for how you resolve uh, the, the um, inability to, for the debts to be paid. And the point is, uh, in the period while that is being addressed, uh, 
the firm is on hold, assets get uh, stripped away. Um, and because A depends on B and B depends on C, when you have this gridlock, if A is in this limbo, then B is in limbo, then C is in limbo. So that means that the trade-off between perfection and speed changes dramatically when you have a systemic bankruptcy, a systemic a gridlock. So, but, but who oversees it? Every who manages? proposal. Who is overseeing the procedure, the super chapter 11 procedure? Oh, you still need the courts. You still need to, okay. but it's changed in the presumptions. Um, it says, you know, ongoing management, if it satisfies a certain level of legal, uh, 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 goes ahead and, and others can make, uh, uh, objections, but there is a burden of proof that's higher to stop, uh, the resolution in, in terms of, you know, sort of like prepackaged bankruptcy. Would you, so as a question, would you, would this be international or just country by country? Oh, this is, I was addressing this for the United States. But this is a problem that will face many, many countries. And there is a similar kind of problem in sovereign debt. Uh, the, the risk of sovereign debt cascades going around the world is also serious. But that's another topic that I, I don't have to OK? So let me just do the last one, and then we can open up for, for questions. The last two slides. The third set of problems are, have been talked about in a couple of your webinars, uh, um, and these are supply chain problems um, that uh, it's not just a demand problem, uh, and that's why for now uh, referring to these programs as a stimulus is a misnomer, uh, it's a lack of supply, it's a shutdown of production, and that will, in a you know, sort of a reversal of, of safe law, that will create its own lack of demand in the way that I've just uh, described a few minutes ago. But it could eventually see shortages in important products. And we're already seeing some shortages in tests, um, uh, uh, in masks. Uh, and these shortages uh, can be extended to food supply, uh, uh, you had a good webinar where we talked about interruption in the global supply chains, uh, especially if some countries worried about shortages impose uh, export restraints. Uh, and we we noticed uh, in one of your earlier webinars the irony of the United States, even though it imports more than it exports on uh, critical healthcare supplies, was talking more about, than other countries about re imposing uh, export restraints. But the important point is that there are large changes in the structure of demand, at least in the short run. Not, people aren't going to be doing airlines, aren't going to be going to uh, uh, theater. Um, and uh, as we've seen in the context of structural transformations, markets often don't manage these changes well. Uh, there's an important intellectual question, theoretical question, how do we explain this? Um, and uh, obviously, uh, capital market imperfections are, are, are part of the story. Uh, the sectors that are weak are the very sectors that don't have resources to be able to move into others. Uh, absence of risk markets is part of it. Behavioral economics is part of it. Next slide. Uh, this is the final slide. Uh, and. I know you want to end by uh, 1.30 or 1.35, so I, <laughs> uh, this, uh, the supply shortages combined with the enormous increases in liquidity and big government deficits are naturally beginning to raise among economists worries about inflation. Um, it's not very much in the popular uh, press, uh, but uh, in some of the previous webinars, there were hints of people beginning to be worried about this, the discussion about wartime deficits uh, and how they were managed. Um, and I uh, just have two brief points. One is uh, there are going to be these 
shortages, and we should consider government interventions in the production and distribution of essential goods. Uh, actions that, had they been taken earlier in the case of mass protective gear and tests, might have saved a multitude of lives. So we, we have to, you know, I began my uh, discussion saying there's a lot of uncertainties and we don't know if we could be sure that this was going to be over in another couple of weeks. We could say, don't worry about this. This is just a, a short interruption. But if it goes on, uh, there, there can be significant effects, in particular commodities that are very important, including food, certain food, uh, food commodities. The second point is uh, the worry that the imbalance of supply and demand uh, will uh, uh, lead to inflation. Let me say very, my perspective is uh, these should not impede the current efforts. Uh, as I already said, the most likely outcome in the immediate aftermath of the control of the pandemic itself is still going to be the deficiency of aggregate demand. And that's because both of so many balance sheets are going to be on both corporate side, household side, firm side are going to be weakened. And there's going to be enormous uncertainty. We're not going to ever, people will worry, will there be a, another episode? So we are going to be facing an increase in precautionary uh, behavior and uh, consumption will be weak and investment will, will, be, will be weak. So the most likely outcome I see is in the immediate aftermath of the, of the, the pandemic is a deficiency of aggregate demand. So we may have to think of even more deficit spending, uh, basically a, a form of socializing risk. Uh, but we will have to monitor what's going on very carefully with a, a readiness to raise taxes. And of course, my view, given the inequalities, given the weaknesses in our system before, these will have to be progressive taxes, environmental taxes, and possibly tighten uh, monetary uh, policy. So to me, uh, uh, Economists should always keep in mind all the risks going forward, but I don't think inflation is something that we need to put at the forefront of our mind. Uh, I think deficiency of aggregate demand is a far more likely problem, but we will have to monitor things very carefully. Thanks a lot, uh, Joe. So I have several questions. I will put it into four blocks, if you don't mind, and we can sure. you know, answer each block very briefly. So the one block is about inflation, and some people want to know what's your take on QE in this environment. Do you think it's very useful to QE? And the other question is a little bit what came up also last Friday, is that what's different this time around is there's huge fiscal expansion. So it's not only on the monetary side, and it seems like when you say you have to raise taxes, you also subscribe, it's not necessarily central bank which has to act, but it is the fiscal side which has to do something. And if you really want to kill off inflation, don't you have to tax the people with the highest marginal propensity to consume? So rather than imposing taxes on the rich, which you know we both favor, but uh, you have to impose taxes on the people with the highest marginal propensity to consume, just to play a little bit devil's advocate. Okay, so on the second, no, the, the, the answer is, take more taxation of those in the top to get the same diminution of aggregate demand. You're right about that. But uh, we'll be entering a period where uh, we have, uh, for those who worry about these things, a very high debt GDP ratio and all the more reason to get a lot of tax revenue in to address uh, the, the overall balance sheet uh, of, of the country. And unlike, uh, you know, a lot of us said we should never just focus on the liability side uh, of, the of the government's balance sheet, but this is like a war where you wind up with a lot of liability, 
without the assets in terms of infrastructure or technology uh, to show for it. So you, you might make a, a more compelling case than you do in other cases to, to say this is time to use that progressive taxation to uh, really uh, uh, correct, you know, to both tame excess demand and to correct the balance sheet problems. And uh, a lot of what's been done uh, and has came out in this article I mentioned by Peter Orzak, uh, that uh, 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 so much money is put corporations and the billionaires beginning in, in 2017, you might say it makes a lot of sense to uh, correct that. QE is not going to uh, address uh, lowering interest rates from 5% to 1% didn't provide much stimulus of the economy. Uh, and uh, we know why the interest elasticities tend to get very low when there's a high degree of uncertainty. This is a period when there's a high degree of uncertainty uh, and uh, a very big balance sheet effects. So I don't think QE is the appropriate instrument. It will have to be more fiscal policy. And I think there's a lot of scope for fiscal policy because of the deficiencies in our overall economic framework that I talked about at the very beginning of the talk. So Laurent Colvey would like to know something on the financial side. Uh, shouldn't we build up a system which is more resilient in the long run? And how can we do this in a world where finance is very much short-term focused? Do you have any recipe for that? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, one of my critiques in the beginning is that our, our, our economic system has been insufficiently resilient. And, you know, the natural question is why? And I think the natural answer to that is, uh, can be put in a couple of different ways. You can talk about short-termism in the corporate sector. You can talk about uh, the absence of error debris security so people don't uh, adequately evaluate the risks going uh, forward. Uh, there are different ways of saying the same thing. Uh, I think in terms of policy reforms, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, one needs uh, that might correct uh, the problem are the loyalty chairs that Patrick Bolton and his, uh, some other people at uh, Columbia Business School have been talking about, where you basically incentivize, uh, you, you say that those people who have long-term interest in the corporation get more voice. Um, there are a number of uh, other ideas uh, along uh, in, uh, lines, um, for instance, um, giving more uh, scope for development banks that think more long-term, uh, that give money to those who are thinking long-term. And that's why in New York State, we've created a climate change bank uh, because uh, markets were not thinking long enough term in that respect. A third important change is uh, in our system of uh, legal liability, fiduciary responsibility uh, in the United States and in many other countries, uh, fiduciaries are not allowed to look at the long-term. They're supposed to look at the short-term, uh, what is maximizing market value today. And that, almost enc that, that encourages short-termism. And there's an argument that we ought to flip that around. And pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, all ought, and the legal framework should encourage uh, fiduciaries who, especially fiduciaries like pension funds who have a 30, 40 year obligation to explicitly look at the long-term uh, uh, consequences of the firms, of the actions of the firms in which they are invested. So that will actually put more focus on the long term. So let me group all the final questions together. So Robert Owen and others asked about the social contract. How do you see the social contract evolving? And uh, you know, Spain had used some elements of universal basic income. Are you in favor of, of you know just broad brush 
subsidies. And should the appropriate distributional effects you mentioned initially from all the programs, so the government has to pick some winners. Should the government pick winners based on national interest, strategic national interest? And the final question I want to throw in uh, is like, should we suspend competition for the development of a vaccine just to make sure that, you know, the pharma companies work all together to develop very quickly a vaccine? It's a little bit out of the order, but I just want to put all the crap. Sure, there's lots of good questions there. I'm sorry, I, I, I have to be very brief. I think clearly uh, there is a need for a new social contract. It was one of my, uh, the theses of my recent book, uh, People, Power and Profits. Uh, but I think the crisis is going to uh, bring that home in a very forceful way. Uh, the reason particularly is people have become very aware that the people who are being brought down by the crisis are uh, the frontline workers, uh, the uh, uh, low income workers, who uh, even people in the healthcare sector uh, who are providing enormous services, but uh, many of these people do not get adequate pay. And somehow th there seems to be, you know, anybody who believes in marginal productivity says, well, let's look at the social marginal productivity. What are they contributed? And is the compensation that they're getting anywhere commensurate with what they've done for all of us. And I think a lot of us feel that there's obviously, this crisis has really exposed uh, that gap um, and exposed the gaps. You know, I, I mentioned before the lack of protective gear for these frontline people is really quite uh, stark. So it's also highlighted the importance of externalities, the importance of, uh, the fact that people without bargaining power are those who are suffering the most. This is not a competitive equilibrium in the usual sense. Bargaining powers, uh, power uh, really uh, matters. Um, and so it's highlighted all the deficiencies in the market and how we haven't been able uh, to address that. And that's why we need a new social contract. Uh, my own feeling on UBI is that when I think of all the things that need to be done in the next 20 years, uh, the green transition, um, uh, constructing uh, our infrastructure, constructing access uh, to healthcare for all. Uh, you look around the United States, you look around the world and uh, the view that I have is what, our emphasis should be on making sure that there are jobs, paying decent wages for everybody who is able and willing to work. And obviously in the midst of this crisis, we are having a UBI, we're giving money to everybody because there's no alternative. Uh, work is not a possibility. Uh, and so the current program, which is the version of a temporary UBI, makes a lot of sense. But for the long run, our focus should be making sure our economy works and providing jobs for everybody who wants it. The um, uh, issue of uh, uh, providing vaccines uh, for all uh, uh, is very much linked with the issue of IPR that I talked about uh, in the beginning. Uh, the Gates Foundation is doing an amazing uh, uh, job on this. Uh, they're going ahead and uh, it's very clear that we will probably get a vaccine, uh, but there are several different uh, vaccines that are uh, in the trials or about to begin trials. And uh, they recognize that uh, if we wait to find out, it will delay the production of the vaccine by months and months during which thousands of people, tens of thousands of people will die. So my understanding is they're going ahead and building factories 
on, uh, on each of the major technologies. And then one or the other will, will pan out. I think that's a, a really, uh, it's the kind of thing government ought to be doing. But our government isn't stepping up and didn't step up when we needed uh, taking strong actions and now is not stepping up and making sure that we have the vaccines. This is really a global issue and in which everybody in the world uh, has a stake. And uh, unfortunately, um, my conversations with people in the scientific community are very worried that while other countries are acting in a very cooperative way, uh, America's me first, uh, America first, uh, is less than fully cooperative. And um, well, obviously, you know, one of the important things about thinking about this from a global point of view, it's a pandemic, and we won't really fully address either the health or the economic implications until we address it in every country around the world. So this really is a case of a global public good, a global externality that has to be addressed in, in a global way. And the intellectual property regime uh, may impede it unless governments are willing to use the compulsory license provisions that uh, are part of TRIPS but which have been undermined over the years and in which unfortunately the US government has uh, in a bipartisan way has opposed developing and emerging markets using those provisions when uh, it comes time for them to make uh, medicines affordable, uh, accessible to all. So uh, I think there, there needs to be at least for the, this emergency uh, an agreement that uh, compulsory licenses should be accepted as the norms. And of course, those who are spending research have to get adequately compensated for that. That should be a given, uh, but uh, the, the w that's not the way to provide our, that's a way to say, if you're going ahead and doing research, we will, we will support you. But in the end, we have to make sure that there's access to medicines for all. Thanks a lot, uh, Joe. This is a nice segue to our next event on Friday at 12.30 New York time, where Michael Kramer will actually talk exactly how to induce companies and how to design the system in such a way that everybody is producing uh, new vaccines and diagnostic devices. So that's, it was a feast to cover all the different aspects of the program. And uh, I would like to do a little bit of advertising for next Friday already, which now we have covered to some extent. And I know that you've written on this topic as well. And I hope to see you all on Friday again. If you want to check it out, uh, check out the website bcf.princeton.edu. You find all the uh, speakers and you will also find uh, today's YouTube link once we have done it. So if you have missed it, you can still watch it afterwards. Thanks a lot, Joe. It was a pleasure to have you. And thank you. Uh, thank you. chat with you soon again. Thanks. Great, thank you.